Um, Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> talking about school this morning in the sermon. Uh, my mind also today went back to something that happened in college. My first class of my first semester of my first year of college, I went to this class called math, of course, which I didn't like. Uh, but the very next class, my second class, was a class on personal evangelism. And the name of that professor was Dr. Bruce McAllister. Now, you say, what does that mean to us? Uh, it doesn't, I don't expect it to mean anything to you, but it did to me because I knew that Dr. McAllister, Bruce, was a, a college friend of my brothers-in-law. And they actually played on the same basketball team in college and, and got the championship, won the championship game together. I knew that about him. He didn't know I was Rick's younger brother-in-law. And so I introduced myself that first day of class. And there was kind of a, just a neat, friendly connection with Bruce during my undergrad years and even during my grad time when I was on staff there. He was someone that I would go to for counsel and, and, uh, and encouragement and sharpening. And he had uh, an impact in my life that, that survives till today. But then, you know, time goes on. I left uh, this, my staff position at the university and... 1994 to enter pastoral ministry and uh, my pastoral ministry took me to first to Richmond Virginia then Winston-Salem then Virginia Beach and now here and I just you know I didn't really stay in touch with Bruce not that it was a, a bummer to him but I just got busy and he already was busy as well so on a whim I think it was last year I was I was putting the finishing touches on a Sunday morning sermon for here and I remembered a quote that I got from Bruce all those years ago in a class. And it was actually, what is the definition of worship? And it, and it was perfect for the sermon that I was writing for that Sunday morning to you. And so I, I found that quote, and I put it in my sermon. And, uh, and it was ready to go for our, our service here. But before I finished in my study at the house that morning, I decided to... Uh, I had Bruce's cell number still, though I hadn't been using it, and I decided to text him and just thank him out of the blue. It's been over 20 years since we've communicated, and, you know, I don't know if you remember, I'm Jim, and, you know, remember Rick, my brother-in-law, and I just want to thank you for your investment in my life all those decades ago. You said something to me way back uh, in the 90s, actually, that I'm still quoting today, and I'm quoting to our church family this morning in my sermon, so I just wanted to say thank you. I didn't expect a text message back in like 30 seconds. And, uh, and this is what he sent to me after all those years of silence. He said, Jim, thank you so much for these encouraging words. I love and respect you so much. So thankful for you and your steadfastness in Christ. Have a great day serving the Lord. I will pray for you now, your friend Bruce. I was not expecting that in like 30 seconds after I sent him mine. I wasn't expecting the text itself, but I especially wasn't expecting the, 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 the words of endearment and familiarity still on his heart towards me. I mean, that just blew me away there at my desk in my basement. To think that after all these years, he had somehow, he still had memories of me and talking beyond just a casual way, it's like he picked up right where we left off. And I was blown away with the fact that I was on his mind. And he had somehow perhaps been keeping track of me through the years. You know, that was a great encouragement to my heart. As much as that encouraged my heart, there's another reality that encouraged my, encourages my heart every single day, even today. I asked the Lord to keep it in front of my mind, not just for the sermon, but for Jim. I needed it. And, and it's, it's this truth. It's nothing about Bruce. It's everything about Jesus. And the truth is that Jesus is precious to my own heart. He's in my thoughts. He's on my lips often and daily. And I want it to be even more. As a matter of fact, you might remember as we early on in our Peter uh, study, in 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter writes to his audience then and to us now these words, Though you have not seen him, Jesus, 
you love him. I mean, you've never seen him and you love him. And though you do not see him right now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. I mean, think about that. You've never seen Jesus. Peter's writing this. He had seen Jesus. He saw Jesus in his humanity for three years. During that time, he saw the glorified Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration. And then he saw the resurrected Jesus on the other side of the cross. He saw Jesus ascend into the opened heavens above him. And I'm sure he's thinking about that. Peter has memories of what Jesus looked like in all of those scenes. But he's writing to these recipients of his epistle, Jew and Gentiles, who had never seen him. And he says, but for some strange reason, he has given you a faith, and you love someone you've never seen. And though you don't see him now, but you believe in him, and then he just kind of trips over his pen saying, what kind of an exuberant joy has entered your heart? He says, you greatly rejoice. You don't just rejoice. You greatly rejoice with a joy inexpressible. You can't put it into words, and it just fills you with glory never seen him. I think of Jesus and talk about Jesus often, but I want to treasure him even more than I do now. I want that love to increase. I want that joy to increase. And perhaps I'm speaking for you and your heart's yearning too, that he remains on your minds and your lips daily, but you want more. That's interesting to me. Even though we can't see him, He's right here in our affections. But I want to direct your attention to the other side of that equation tonight. That even though you can't see Jesus, not only is your heart loving someone you haven't seen, but that same person, Jesus, the Son of God, has you on his heart and lips all the time, even daily. I want you to see this in Romans chapter 8 this evening. Romans chapter 8. Last week we, we spent time studying verses 26 and 27 and how the Holy Spirit is praying for you incessantly, speaking to the Father, the first person of the Trinity, and, and he's speaking to him in an inner Trinitarian communication that the best description is unalterable words, unalterable communication. It's inter-Trinitarian. But not only is he interceding for you specifically by name and as a group of the redeemed, the Father already knows the heart of the Spirit. And there's an inter-Trinitarian, con- I don't know if conversation's the right word, but an inter-Trinitarian affectionate, intimate communication going on about you. That's the spirit. But tonight I want you to see that this incessant focus on you, the redeemed, is also a reality with Jesus, the Son. Romans chapter 8, follow along as I read verses 31 to 34. Four verses. The last two verses are going to take us to a court scene. Look at verse 31 with me. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He, the Father, who did not spare his own Son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him, Jesus, freely give us all things? He's asking some good questions. He's going to answer that with two verses of an illustration from a courtroom. Verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It's a good question. God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who also intercedes for us. A court scene and two questions. And I particularly want to direct your attention to verses 33 and even beyond that, 
ultimately, verse 34. Because what these verses are saying is that you, and this is a fact in your, I put in your notes, you remain on Jesus' mind and lips at this very moment. You do. See, how can you say that? Well, let's enter into this courtroom and look around. Verses 33 and 34. I have three questions that are going to build out three realities of Christ praying for you. These realities will grow out of verse 34 with the assistance of verse 33. The first question is this. What did it require for Jesus to be interceding for you incessantly, even when you're sleeping? Even if you slip into a coma and prepare to enter eternity, not you won't wake up before you enter eternity, uh, it might be days, hours, weeks, or months. If you are one of the redeemed, this is true for you. This is true for you when you find yourself in a difficult assignment. When you find yourself in a heavy season of life. This is true for you on your worst day and your, your best day. Jesus' mind and lips are focused on you. This isn't to build your self-esteem. This isn't to say how precious you are in the sense that you earned this attention from Jesus. This isn't an emotional squish time. This is a theological reality that should blow us away. It has everything to do with the glory of the Son and the Father. What did it require for him to be interceding for you like this? And I want to say that there are five theological realities that Paul has already developed several times in this epistle before chapter 8. And so I'm going to give you these realities, these theological realities, and some verses for you to jot down. What's the first theological reality that qualifies Jesus to stand as your advocate and your interceder and your high priest? First of all, letter A, Christ's incarnation. Look at verse 34. It says, who's the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Stop. If he was living a life here as a, as a man, um, that means if he had to die a real death, that means that he lived a real life. There's something here that I don't want you to miss, and Paul has developed it uh, earlier in this epistle, and it's the fact that he was incarnated. This is the infinite God-man entered time and space as a human without surrendering his deity. Uh, a couple verses to look at for this. Romans chapter 1, and I'm just going to read Paul's first three verses, the opening of this epistle. Paul, a bondservant of of Christ Jesus called as an apostle set apart for the gospel of God which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning who his son Jesus who was and this is where he starts this amazing epistle of Romans he starts it with the incarnation it says concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to to the flesh. In verse 4, he was declared the Son of God with power by resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. So you have this is a, a Trinitarian opening to this epistle. And he starts it on the note of the incarnation. God became man. As we learn from the prophet Isaiah, the name Emmanuel means so much to us. It's God with us. He didn't just cast a human shadow. He was a human. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. That's his incarnation. If you go back to Romans chapter 8, and keep a marker here at Romans 8 as we move around, in Romans chapter 8, verse 3, we have one more example of him highlighting the incarnation of the son. What the law could not do, verse 3, weak as it was through the flesh, God did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering of sin, for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. 
This is square one. This is the beginning of the story. For Jesus to be able to stand in front of the Father on your behalf and intercede for you incessantly, he had to become one of you. To be your high priest, as the writer of Hebrews will say. So what's the first theological reality of what his interceding ministry required? It was Christ's incarnation. He had to become man. What's the second theological reality? Well, again, look at verse 34 here in Romans. We have to, we have to understand what's implied here. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Stop. You see, that's where we stopped last time. I need you to stop again. If he died, that means he was living a life before that. And the question needs to be asked, what kind of life did he live? Not just that he was here and lived a life, but tell me about the life he lived. And this is letter B. This is the second theological reality. Christ's obedience. His obedience. And I'm not here just talking about what theologians call his passive obedience, we're going to talk about that still on this list further down. His passive obedience is what he suffered at the hands of man and therefore endured from his own heavenly father when he was on the cross. Well, I'm talking about what theologians call his active obedience. How he fulfilled all righteousness. How he was without sin. Now think of that. Just say, well, he was a nice guy. No, it's way deeper than that. He didn't sin with not only his body and his actions, he didn't sin with his mouth, and he never sinned with his thoughts. And as we're taught, and in in some of you who've trained in evangelism explosion, there are two types of sins. You have sins of omission and sins of commission. Omission is when I, I don't do what God commanded me to do, and sins of commission are, are when I, is when I, I do what God tells me not to do. I mean, you can build this out any way you want to go, right on, right on to his thoughts and motives. Jesus Christ had no sin. He was God, became man, and lived a sinless life. And boy, has Paul ever built this out for us already in this epistle. I, I, can, I can spend the rest of the hour going to these texts, but I'm just going to give you one, one verse here in Romans and then a cross-reference in the Gospel of John. But in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, it says, For as through one man's disobedience, that's Adam, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, that's Jesus, the many will be made righteous. One of the many claims and propositional truths in the epistle of Romans, affirming the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. Even on his last evening before the cross in the upper room, it's funny how we keep making our way to that passage of scripture. I should just preach through it and get it out of my system. But in John 15, in the upper room, verse 10, these, these are Jesus' words. I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. What a claim that only he could make He kept every commandment perfectly from the heart and in doing so there was an expression of love to the Father that is reciprocated in a sweet Trinitarian, inter-Trinitarian way. I abide in his love. Had Jesus not come and had Jesus not lived a perfect life he could not stand and be your, your high priest before the Father tonight. He couldn't do it, but he did. There's a third theological reality of, that had to be met in order for him to be the one who prays for you now. Letter C is Christ's sacrifice. Yes, now we are square back in the middle of verse 34 of Romans 8. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Stop again. We're going to talk about that one now. We want to talk about the fact that his sacrifice was ultimate and perfect 
and 100% efficient and effective, for those of you who are engineers. Uh, go back to Romans chapter 5. And again, we could go to many passages, but I'll stay close to Romans 8. Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. Follow along as I read these familiar verses to you. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. It doesn't end there. He died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we will be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if we were enemy, for if uh, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. This is a theological reality that had to happen in order for him to stand before the Father and pray for you, intercede for you, speak for you. He had to die. The death wasn't for his sin. The death was for the sin of all who would believe in him. This sacrifice was immense. You see it again in chapter 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Because he died the perfect death, we as believers stand with him. We are identified with him in the sight of his Father. We have union with him. We have been baptized. We've been, we've been placed into him, into his death. When I baptize people up here, I, the words I say as I take you down under the water is buried in the likeness of Jesus' death. And that's just an illustration of a theological reality that's true about you. Christ gave his life so that we could have life. There's a fourth theological reality that was required before he could be our faithful high priest. The fourth one, letter D, is Christ's resurrection. Christ's resurrection. He didn't stay dead. He's alive. We celebrate it every time we come together to worship, and especially next Sunday, but not only next Sunday. We serve, what does the hymn writer say? A living Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever people say. He's alive. As a matter of fact, I read this in Romans chapter 1, verse 4. He was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. He's alive. In Romans chapter 4, verse 25, you know these verses. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. This isn't just a simple, just for the optics of it, okay, you're dead, and then, then you're going to be alive again. When he, when he burst forth and conquered death because of the spirit of holiness, that meant that one day those who are his redeemed will, will not suffer the second death. We will be forever with him. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9. I love these, or these words when it comes to evangelism. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting into salvation. He's alive. And you know, I love Paul's words in Philippians chapter 2. Just remember that chapter with these, uh, this particular point. He became obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. Remember that? And Paul doesn't leave him there. That God has exalted him and given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess in heaven and earth and all creation that he is Lord. That had to happen. His resurrection had to happen if he's going to be your intercessor before the Father. But there's one more theological reality that 
It ties it all off. What had to happen? What did it require? His incarnation, his obedience, his sacrifice, his resurrection, but there's one more, his ascension. His ascension. And we see that in verse 34 of Romans chapter 8. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised. And look at this. And who is at the right hand of God right now. And what's he doing? He's interceding for who? Us. I love Acts chapter 2, verse 33, where it talks about Jesus having been exalted to the right hand of God. It's Peter's sermon at Pentecost. He said, Peter's in essence saying, oh, he's alive and he's here, but he's not just here. He's at the Father's right hand. Now he has the posture. He has met all requirements on a human level to be your intercessor. I didn't add this to the list, but I do want to let you hear from Jesus himself that at the Father's right hand, he's not just taking up an available seat. Jesus states in the Gospel of John, Chapter 5, verses 22 to 27. I'll read these to you. 5, 22 to 27. Jesus says, I use that throne. I'm the final judge. It says, chapter 5, verse 22. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. So that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to exercise judgment because he is the son of man. Oh, this exalted Lord Jesus is anything but passive and is anything but docile and inactive. He's interceding for his redeemed. And he will be coming as judge to judge the wicked. I'm always captured by what I read on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 31. He has fixed a day in which he, God the Father, will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So you say, what what right does Jesus have to intercede for me, to plead for me? Every reason he needed. Incarnation, obedience, sacrifice, resurrection, and ascension. You say, well, who's accusing me? In verse 33, who's trying to bring a charge in the future against me, one of God's elect? In verse 34, who's the one who's condemning? Who's pointing at me and saying to the judge, guilty, not worthy of your grace, not worthy of your mercy, not worthy of your rescue? I want to know who's doing that. Well, we don't have to look far. I want you to write down Romans or Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. I'll read it to you. Revelation 12, verse 10. You know what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come back to that verse. I want to, first of all, read to you from the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter three. Go to the end of the Old Testament. Sorry about that. Zechariah chapter three. That's not right. Zechariah chapter three. That's not right either. Who got into my notes today? Did someone get one of my books? 
I am lost in my notes here. I am sorry for that. Well, we can't edit that out of the video. Zechariah chapter 3, where it says, Every eye will behold him. That's the passage I'm looking for. I found it. It was Zechariah chapter 3, and that's not the passage. That's the last chapter of Zechariah. Zechariah 3, I'm back up here now. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. You had Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel had been come back to Jerusalem from Babylon and were responsible to resettle the people and rebuild the temple, lay the foundation. They were holding off because of oppression. And Zechariah and Haggai showed up, and God used those two prophets, these two prophets, to motivate them to get moving again. That's the context of Zechariah. But I want you to see chapter 3. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. And he, the one on the throne, spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. And again he said to him, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. I love that. Then I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing. And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and if you will perform my service, then you will also govern my house and also have charge of my courts and I will grant you free access among these who were standing here. As I said, Joshua was responsible for the temple that was going to be rebuilt and the foundation laid, and Zerubbabel was the governor, for lack of a better word, um, of the city, of the remnant that came back. And we're, we're taken backstage there in chapter 3 of Zechariah where the accuser that the book of Revelation calls Satan was pointing at him. Accusers always point, and they say, Look at that. Look at that. And what was the accuser pointing at with Joshua? We know he had filthy garments symbolizing his personal sin. And Joshua had no defense in and of himself. You know, as, as one commentary reminded me this week, we actually probably have to agree with a lot of the, the charges against us by the enemy. The enemy knows our weaknesses. The enemy is aware of our failures, and he points at them and says, unworthy, they're unworthy of your affection and your rescue. And I love what I see there in Zechariah chapter 3, and I see back here in Romans chapter 8 again, that God is the one ultimately who sinned against by our personal sin, right? David said in Psalm 51, verse 4, Against you and you only have I sinned. And how amazing is it, not only in that scene in Zechariah 3, but back here in Romans chapter 8, that the, the one who is the most offended in the courtroom is the one who says, I've justified him. I've declared him righteous. Verse 33. The accuser is active, no doubt, Focusing on your past and your present. And the one that's most offended isn't the accuser. It's the judge. And he accepts you and declares you righteous. That's amazing. Back to Romans 8, 34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God and who also intercedes for us because of what it required, because of what Christ accomplished. We're not denying that the accuser is there and has things to accuse us with, but we're seeing that there is a son standing before the Father who's justified you and affirming 
that you are his and you stand righteous in his presence. I say all that to say this. There is nothing that can keep Jesus from his Father's presence on your behalf. Nothing. All the boxes have been checked. The one who at one point on a cross declared, Why have you forsaken me? Mark 15, 34. Is now the one who's seated at the right hand of the Father on your behalf. What did it require? That's the first reality we need to settle. There's a second reality. Because that's pretty powerful. That's theology. That's five steps of theology. But there's a second question that I might have after considering that theology. And it's this. Where does it happen? Where's this intercession taking place if it's going on all the time? Well, again, look at verse 34. Who's the one who condemns Christ Jesus? Is he who died? Yes, rather, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who also intercedes for us? How do we answer this? Where is this happening? Where is the conversation happening? It gets a little tricky here. We take verse 34 at face value. Scripture's clear. And the first letter A I want to give to you is this. It's happening at the Father's right hand. You say, where's the Father's right hand? Well, I think we can say it's there in heaven. You say, where's heaven? I don't know. The older I get and the more I study Scripture, the more I'm realizing it's closer than we realize it's not in outer space or beyond the ceiling of the cosmos. Kind (laughs) of. Of course, the Creator is above His creation, so you still have to deal with that. But I do know that over and over in Scripture, we hear of the heavens opening. Jesus' baptism, the heavens were opened. A voice came out of that opening, and the Spirit descended like a dove. It looked like a, it looked like a fluttering, I would think, a fluttering Shekinah descending. It wasn't coming from outer space. It was coming from above, somewhere near. So the first answer here, where is this happening? Well, the Father's right hand, there in heaven, where the Father is enthroned. When the heavens are opened in the book of Revelation to release judgments, even Jesus himself will come to judge at the great battle. It's going to come out of an opening nearby, above us, whatever that means. It's difficult. But if we call the third heaven the abode of God, which I think we can theologically use that language, it's not perfect in our human terms, this is happening there. You say, well, that's, that's interesting. Well, what's really interesting to me is that Jesus is a human. He has a body, a resurrected body in that realm right now, which is a spirit realm. Fuses are blowing right now. How can that be? I don't know, but it says it's happening. But it's not just happening at the Father's right hand, letter B. It's happening in the believer's inner man. Because God himself indwells. If we say it's happening there in heaven, it's also also happening from here through the indwelling of Christ. Now again, we go to the upper room. The upper room has so many answers to questions we ask. Listen to this language from John 14, verses 16 to 23. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that's the Spirit, that he may be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. The Spirit is indwelling you. But keep reading, verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. And listen to this verse. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So now we have every member of the Trinity getting in on this indwelling us. We have the Holy Spirit, we have the Spirit of Christ, and Christ even says later, In this passage, in chapter 17, verse 21, 
talking to the Father, he says, As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, may these disciples be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. It's mind-blowing. But God himself indwells us as his children. Where is this happening? It's happening in the abode of God, and it's happening in us. So, you see, how can you reconcile that? Is there a distinction? I have to say no. It's the same thing. It's a both and that he's filling a twofold role, which is really one role. I put this in your notes. Both and he's the advocate and priest at the Father's right hand and also from his being in me, to use his language. That brings this really close to home. We're not merely getting a report about something that's going on and we can't see it and it's far away. It's true. But every member involved is in us. Hebrews 7, verse 25 uses language that's right in line with what we're saying. Hebrews 7, 25, he, Jesus, is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. That's chapter 7, verse 25. Just a few verses later, chapter 8, verse 1. Now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. We also see in chapter 9, verse 24, Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So we have to be content, though our mind can't wrap its understanding around this, that both realities are true. He's at the Father's right hand interceding for us, but he's also in us fully. And there's a communication going on both and, and that's all I can describe it with, are those words. But it means what we can understand still communicates that this is highly personal, very local and close, and the realities affect your inner man. Hmm. You know, even in a passage that we treasure this Easter weekend coming up, Isaiah 53, in verse 12, it talks about this reality we're talking about tonight. Jesus intercedes for you. Listen to verse 12. He, Jesus, poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many, listen, and interceded for the transgressors. How precious. See, well, this is pretty good. I mean, what it took theologically for this to happen is amazing. That answered the first question. Where is this happening? It's, at the very least, we say, mind-blowing. To think of this happening in heaven. But it's so intimate because the one doing it indwells us. That's a, Wow. We could spend the rest of our life studying that out and should. But I have one more question. Is it ever possible that this may end someday in our lives? I mean, could I mess this up? I mean, we need to be honest with each other. We're usually our worst accusers, aren't we? And that's the third question before we're finished. When will this end and I'm glad that you asked that question because Paul is going to continue to write the answer in this chapter. Remember when I was a kid, there, the super glue was a big, exciting invention. I don't know how old it was, but uh, I remember the commercials for super glue when it came out. And the commercial started with trying to impress you with how quickly super glue dries. And so there was a coffee mug, remember this commercial, and a broken handle. And, and during the commercial, without the video skipping, he puts the drops there, puts the, the handle back on the coffee mug, and lifts it up. 
It just, I mean, that fast, boom. That's, it, it dries fast. But by the end of the commercial, you remember how the commercial ends, it's not just about how quickly it dries, but how strong it is. You have a guy that put some super glue on a hat and stuck it to a construction um, girder or whatever that's called, and, and, and he's holding onto the hat and swinging from it. And they're trying to make the impression that, you know, this guy has all these stories up. He has probably four inches off the floor in the studio. But it's to give the impression that this thing can save your life. It can sustain your full weight. You know, as I think of that commercial, I'm reminded of this question. As far as Christ interceding for me, praying for me to the Father, as my high priest, my advocate, will it ever end? Is there anything that can break this arrangement now that has started? And the answer is no. How do you know that? Look at verse 35 of Romans 8. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. So I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The short answer is, nothing can stop this now that it's started on your behalf. This, this inner Trinitarian conversation and affection for you. That's incessant. I give you a list here to summarize what Paul has built out here at the end of Romans 8. Letter A, it's not because of our sin. Our sin won't stop this. That's been taken away. You say, where's that in Romans? Chapters 1 through 8. That's where it is. All the chapters. Letter B, it's not because of our circumstances. We can't go through a difficult circumstance, a persecution or a, or a trial or tribulation or distress because all of our circumstances have been redeemed. Romans 8 verses 28 to 30 says nothing will come into our lives but that God uses it to make us more like Jesus. And the worst of things that happen to us under his kind providence, the worst and darkest things are used to make us more like Jesus. Let, uh, let her see, it's not because of our suffering. Our suffering can't separate us from this love. Why? Well, in Romans chapter 5, write it down, verses 1 through 4, we're told that we glory in our sufferings because it produces character. It produces uh, godliness. Our tribulations produce perseverance. Perseverance, proven character. Proven character, hope. And the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Yeah, even the worst of suffering grows us. So letter D, it's not because of our persecution. Suffering is things that are things that uh, we go through. Persecution is what's done to us by persecutors who can't hit Jesus so they swing for us. It's not going to be that that can separate us from the love of God because chapter 2, verses 5 through 11 says there's a coming judgment. There's a coming wrath. Paul writes in verse 5 of chapter 2, because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each person according to his deeds. Those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and who do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, only wrath and indignation. So persecution can't stop this. Letter E, it's not because of our poverty. See, so what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, we... In some countries, and even in ours, it could be poverty is the cost of being a, a Christ follower. 
But Paul had already spelled out in Romans 8.18 that what we suffer here is not worthy to be compared with what is going to be revealed to us. What's coming in heaven. And letter F, it's not because of our enemies. Not just the seen enemies, but the unseen enemies. The principalities and powers, as he wrote. Why? Well, can I just put it to you nicely? They have, they have been impaled. John Piper says, these enemies, in essence, I mean, they're still with us, but they, in crucifying the Lord, sealed the deal on their own suicide. You see, where do you get that? Colossians 2, verses 14 through 15. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has, Jesus has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Wow. So the answer, when will it end? The question is, when will it end? The answer is, never. Never. The Puritan Thomas Brooks. Listen to these guys reflect on these sweet truths. Thomas Brooks wrote, Christ is answerable for all those that are given to him at the last day. And therefore we need not doubt but that he will certainly employ all the power of his Godhead to secure and save all those that he must be accountable for. Christ's charge and care of these that are given to him extends even to the very day of their resurrection that he may not so much as lose their dust, but gather it together again and raise it up in glory to be a proof of his faithfulness. He says, I shall lose nothing but raise it up again on the last day, end quote. Yeah. What you enjoy now, whether it's on your mind or not, doesn't change the reality. What you enjoy with Christ interceding for you at his Father's right hand is a reality that's going on now and will for the rest of your life. You remain on Jesus' mind and lips this very moment. That's kind of cool. Now, you may be still curious, as I am. We've heard last week that the Holy Spirit is interceding with us, not using words, within the Trinity. And you've seen tonight from the same passage that the Son is interceding for you incessantly at the Father's right hand, yet he also indwells you at the same time. You say, I get it. I am loved. He's faithful. But I still want to know what he's praying about. That he is praying is not a question any longer. But what is he praying? I want to know those nouns and verbs. So in God's kindness, two weeks from tonight, after the week after Easter, I think we come back to the series. I have to check the calendar. My next message in the series, we're going to go to the gospel account of Jesus praying for Peter. And this is before the betrayal of Jesus. Peter had no idea that Jesus had been praying for him on this point, nor did he knew, know that he needed that prayer. We're going to visit that scene for an example of how Jesus requests something from the Father for Peter, and Peter didn't even realize it was happening. And then after that, after we see that example, the remainder of our series will take place in the upper room. In John chapter 17, as Jesus prepares his disciples for what will happen later that night, they, he allows them to hear him use nouns and verbs to his Father. And we're going to study for the rest of the series at that point one reality every Sunday night that he prays for you incessantly. 
I have in your notes there a quote from the book that we give away a lot here. If you don't have a copy of this, see me after the service. I'll hand you a copy of this for free. Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland. And I'll close with these words. We cannot present a reason for Christ to finally close off his heart to his own sheep. No such reason exists. Every human friend has a limit. If we offend enough, if a relationship gets damaged enough, if we betray enough times, we are cast out. The walls go up. With Christ, our sins and our weaknesses are the very resume items that qualify us to approach him. Read the whole book. So, brothers and sisters, you're being thought of and prayed for incessantly by the God who indwells you and who is enthroned on high. So, you say, why should you get up tomorrow morning? I have a couple reasons now to give to you. Look at your notes. Would you stand with me as I just, I'm going to pray for us to close us in prayer, and then I'm going to ask you to stay standing for a moment, and we're going to go offline from the recording. I just have a quick announcement for you, okay? But for now, let's pray. Lord, thank you again for allowing us to step into Romans 8 again and, and see things too wonderful to fully grasp with finite minds, but nonetheless, we know they're true and marvelous, and overwhelming, honestly. That this whole hour we've been paying attention to the word, you have been interceding for us. As we were wrestling with difficult theological concepts, you were interceding for us. You are standing in the Father's presence on our behalf. You're making the approach with us on your lips. I pray that, that that rich truth will not let go of our mind as we press into this week. I pray when we're in a dark moment, when we are in a blind moment, a blind moment of fear or rage, when we are in a moment of persecution for our faith, or when we are in a moment of wonderful joy in your word, Bring this truth to our mind and open our eyes to see and understand what your word has taught us tonight. For your glory alone, in Jesus' name we pray.